Great. Thank you, Luke. Again, so thank you all for having me here today. I'm really excited to speak with you just a little bit about our black bear population here in Maryland. Um, again, my name is Jonathan Trudeau. I am the game mammal section leader for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife and Heritage Service. That's a long-winded way of saying that I oversee the black bear, deer, and fur bear programs, and I'm very fortunate to be here. Um, so today, um, I'm just, again, talk to you a little bit about our bears, and please feel free to interject if you have a question while we're going through this presentation. I'm more than happy to engage and answer any questions you might have as we go. So for starters, I want to give you a brief background on the history of black bears in our state. So <clears throat> prior to European settlement, bears actually occupied the entirety of the state there in every single county. Um, so they went they occupied all the way from the shore through Western Maryland. So they're on the coast through the mountains and everywhere in between. As settlers moved westward, um, valuable habitat was lost. You know, they were converting forests over to um, ag lands and they're harvesting bears. You know, the, it was the, the idea of predators were a bad thing. So they're removing basically every bear that they could. By the 1950s, only a few bears actually remained in the state, and that was over in the far western part of the state in Garrett County, where we just had a couple of remnant bears that were still hanging around. But thanks to habitat recovery, regional conservation programs, so when I say regional, I mean the mid-Atlantic region, and western Maryland is now home to a very healthy and, in all reality, growing black bear population. So a little history on the regulated hunting of black bear. So back in 1949, black bear hunting was prohibited statewide. So in 1949, you could not legally harvest a bear anywhere in the state. In 1953, they opened it back up for a one week bear hunting season, um, but that only lasted one year. So in 1954, it was closed again. It would be a excuse me a long time before we saw a bear hunt come back in. In 1972, black bear were actually listed as a state endangered species. So there were very few of them in the state. They're a species that we were really concerned about. Um, but <clears throat> thankfully, by 1980, that legal status actually changed to a non-game species of special concern. So that meant that we were already starting to see a black bear population increase and rebound. In 1985, again, just five short years later, <clears throat> that legal status changed yet again. It changed to a forest game species, meaning the population was viable enough to have a hunting season, but we weren't necessarily going to implement that at that point in time. It took no, about 20 years So in, until we actually had a modern black bear season. So in 2004, DNR conducted our first modern day bear hunt that continues to this day. So this past season, 2023, we actually had our 20th black bear, modern day black bear hunt. This gives you an idea of what that kind of looks like when we look at the number of individuals hunting, the number of bears harvested, and so on. So we actually function on a permit um, system. So unlike other states that have an hour over the counter permit or a license that you can buy to harvest a bear, for us, you have to apply to get a permit. So I mean, it's a lottery based, excuse me, lottery based system where we get anywhere between 45 to 5,500 applicants each year. And the number of permits that we allocate differs depending on so you can see in 2016, we only allocated 750 permits, but in 2023, we allocate 950. Now that differs um, based on kind of what our goals are, whether we want to see more people in the woods trying to harvest additional bears or so on and so forth. When you look at the total number of bears harvested by year, for the most part, we range between 100 to 150-ish bears per year. We did have a record low harvest, or um, no, in recent years anyway, 
in 2021, and that was due to very, very poor hunting conditions during that time frame. It was really hot, it was really wet, and hunters just were out in the woods like they were, were historically. The vast majority of our bears are harvested in Garrett County, which is where we have some of our highest bear densities. Um, but we are seeing more and more bears harvested in some of those more eastern counties. We look at our party success rate. So we allow um, each permittee or permit holder to allocate two additional subpermittees to harvest the bear. Only a single bear can be harvested. So when we look at our party success, it ranges anywhere between, you know, 12 or 11 percent to 24 percent, which is uh, shows that we actually have much higher success than many of our surrounding states, like Pennsylvania, where they have a success rate of two to three percent. Bears occupy a relatively small portion of our state, so they're only in four counties, and we designate this based on where we know we have breeding sows or breeding um, black bear, female black bears in those counties. So, and bear hunting is permitted in all four of those counties, so that's Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, and Frederick counties. Our bear densities are very similar to those in our surrounding states, but we also share this population with the other mid-Atlantic states. So bears that live in Maryland, in all reality, also probably occupy a portion of the range in Pennsylvania or West Virginia or Virginia. So we share this population with our surrounding states. When we look at our black bear population across the Eastern portion of North America, we can see indicated there in yellow in that plot there on the left hand side of the screen. Most states and provinces are indicating that bears are expanding within those jurisdictions. Maryland's no exception as we're seeing our black bear population increase and expand. And it's important to note that those states there on the East Coast that are gray, they are actually also seeing increases in their populations. They just didn't get the data into this particular workshop in time for it to be shown in this plot. When we look at some of our recent bear sightings in Maryland, and these are confirmed bear sightings, not just someone called in saying they think they saw a bear, it's they were confirmed sightings. We've had um, confirmed bear sightings over the last five to eight years in just about every county. Even on the short, well, we had a bear report in Kent, Green Anne's, and Talbot County um, a few years back. And that was a bear that actually came down from New Jersey and decided it wanted to go to the shore for a vacation, I guess. But you can see overall, we're seeing a lot of bears throughout the state and popping up more and more frequently. We monitor our black bear population using a, a variety of um, techniques. Probably the most fun and the thing that most people hear about is our reproductive rate surveys. So every year we go out and um, do den surveys between late February and early March. We're actually gearing up for our den season. We have radio collared sows or sows that have collars that allow us to track them scattered throughout that occupied bear range. And during that den season, we're actually able to locate those dens and go in and collect a bunch of data. When you think of a den, a lot of folks, they'll think of you know a rock den or a cave, something of that nature, or a big hole in the tree or a hole in the ground, which those are bear dens, bears do use them. But most of the time, we actually just find them in brush piles that you saw in the previous slide. Or you can see there on the left, that black spot on that bear hillside that's actually a bear den. den. She decided that she was going to sit up, set up on a south facing slope, made herself a nice little platform. And that's where she spent the winter and gave birth to her cubs and stayed there until April when she went off to find food, you know, that luscious spring food with her cubs. And what's becoming more and more common as bears and humans um, are coming in closer proximity to one another, so we're actually seeing more and more bears denning under homes, under porches, under you know, outbuildings, just under human um, structures. 
And when you think about it from a den perspective, that's essentially a small cave for them. It's well insulated, it's well protected. They're ideal denning sites for black bears. Though most people don't really want a bear denning under their house or anything like that. But from a bear standpoint, they are ideal and amazing den sites. While we're on site, we immobilize this out. So we use a, a sedative to um, anesthetize them. They take a nap. And during that time, we weigh the cubs. We determine sex ratio, so how many males versus females. We actually attach ear tags to each cub, as long as they weigh a certain amount. And we, uh, or, and we implant a pit tag, which is the same thing as a microchip that you would implant in your dog or in your cat, in whatever pet you may have to identify them if they get away. And we do this because to allow us to have two forms um, to identify them if we end up ha handling them again, whether that be in a nuisance situation where we trap them, or they be hit by a vehicle, or they're harvested during the bear season. It allows us to identify where that bear you know, originated, where it went, and can I get an idea of how long these bears are living? If it's a new sow, so a sow that we didn't have collar, we'll actually also take a tooth so we can get an age on it. We're actually able to get an exact age from a tooth, just like you would a tree, where you can actually cut a cross section of it and count the number of rings. So that's valuable, valuable information. We monitor the health of all the bears, um, and that includes blood work. So we're very fortunate to have the Maryland Zoo staff actually come out on every den visit with us, and they collect a lot of that um, health data and monitor the, the bears. Then while we're there, we equip the sow with a new uh, tracking collar. So that may be a VHF, which stands for very high frequency. And that's a car that we actually have to go out with an antenna and track it, just like um, you would with your radio in your car. You have to be in a spot where you can get those radio frequencies. Same thing with this equipment. Or with GPS transmitters, which collect a location every few hours, um, just like you do with your GPS on your phone. But those are very expensive, so we primarily use those VHF um, collars. On average, you no know, bears can give birth between one to five cubs per litter. And in Maryland, over you know, the 20, 30 years that we've been monitoring these, um, these sows, we average three cubs per sow every other year. So cubs that are bears, I'm sorry, they actually reproduce every other year. So if a sow was bred this year or this past summer, she'll produce cubs this, this winter and she won't breed again until the uh, fall or the summer of 2025. So the cubs will actually stay with their mother until they're 18 months old and then they'll disperse. Reproductive rates in the Atlantic region are the highest in the nation. Um, and it indicates a very healthy black bear population and exceptionally um, an excellent habitat for black bears. Here's an image from Western Maryland of a sow that actually had five cubs wandering around. One of our other longstanding um, surveys is our scent station surveys. This allows us to monitor population trends over time. So you can see we've been doing it since the early 90s. And um, these are scent station routes that are run annually in known bear habitat throughout the region. And over the years, we've been adding more and more routes in new counties that are um, documenting black bears. So now these routes include are in Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, Frederick, and Montgomery counties. Now, when you look at that plot, it's kind of deceiving because you can see since 2017-ish, you can see that dark gold line indicates that the percent of sites visited has declined. However, the overall trend has still been increasing. What that doesn't really convey is that we added in a bunch of routes around that time period, including Montgomery County, where we don't have a lot of bears. We get um, you know, frequent uh, reports of bears in those counties. So we want to try to figure out, okay, are bears there on a consistent basis? So 
it's slightly misleading, but overall we're still seeing an increase in trend or a stabilizing trend in those sites visited. What this looks like is we actually suspend three cans of sardines from a tree about eight feet off the ground and about three feet away from the base of or from the tree trunk. So that way a bear has to climb the tree. We'll leave them out for about a week. The bear will climb the tree, leave claw marks, or we'll actually find the cans on the ground with puncture holes in there. And again, that's an indication that the bear was there and the mark asked, okay, there are bears in that area. What this looks like in all reality is something like this. Once in a while, we're fortunate to put a camera on these sites and we can actually see how the bear got to the can. You can see bears are very agile, very flexible. It, really had to lean out there to get that sardine can. You can imagine it's putting a lot of pressure on those claws, digging in, so we're able to identify that in this, indeed, that was a bear. In addition, another you know, historic data set that we use is number of bear complaints received. So as you can imagine, there's a wide variety of things that people will call about related to bears. And we record all of that. We keep track of that because it's a good indication of where bears are and how many bears are in that area. Here we have listed out the bear complaints from 2007 to 2022. I have it kind of blocked out between counties. So Garrett and Allegheny County, again, those are the two counties that we've had bears in the longest or most recently, I should say. Um, and then Washington and Frederick is in that blue. And then all the other counties is that salmon uh, color. You can see that Gary and Allegheny dominate the number of complaints. No, but that's not really all that unexpected because that's where you have our highest bear densities. And in recent years, many of those complaints have actually been from um, tourists or rental companies. It's not residents calling in on a regular basis. Now compare that to Washington and Frederick County, where you can see over the years, that chunk or that percentage of complaints has been steadily increasing or actually stabilizing in recent years, indicating that they're starting to deal with some of those same issues that uh, Garrett and Allegheny County were dealing with 10 years ago. And we're starting to see another kind of increase in all those other counties, and especially those adjacent to Washington and Frederick County, reporting more um, complaints about bears. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind when looking at this is that a single bear in the right county, in the right area, can generate a lot of calls, a lot of emails. And that was the instance this past summer where we actually had a young bear that decided they want to go down the beltway and didn't stop until it got into a backyard right in D.C. So this bear was in D.C. for a day. Or, I, I'm not entirely sure how long, but it, it took the better part of a morning for wildlife professionals to get this bear sedated and out of the area. During a four-day period, I spoke to something like 42 or 43 news stations about this one bear. So you can see a single instance, a single bear can generate a lot of commotion. So those complaints need to be kind of um, looked at with some context in mind. Overall, our nuisance complaints uh, broken down by category it looks something like this. And again, this varies annually. Some years are worse for certain things than others. But in general, the same trends stand, stand firm is that trash is our number one complaint. Bears are getting into, into my trash. Bears are tearing apart my trash cans. And things of that nature, that's our number one complaint. Um, our number two, historically, is typically either um, vehicle collisions or crop damage. In recent years, it's been crop damage. So believe it or not, black bears can actually cause significant amounts of damage to corn. So for farmers, bears can be a huge nuisance and cause a, or essentially have a large negative financial impact on their livelihood. So that's one of our biggest complaints recently. Vehicle collisions is growing Bird feeders is always a 
big complaint, you know, bears are getting into my bird feeder, they're tearing it down, they're bending it over, they're destroying it, things of that nature. But recently, especially since uh, the COVID pandemic, poultry has been a much larger component of our complaints, specifically, you know, backyard chicken coops. Um, now that's been growing in popularity, however, backyard chicken coops, free range chickens in an area with black bear, which like to go for an easy food source, doesn't always work out well. So we do spend a lot of time talking to residents about what they can do, simple steps they can take to minimizing bear conflicts. And a lot of these situations like trash, bird feeders, poultry, something as simple as a um, as an electric fence can actually solve the problem or at least alleviate the problem. We also monitor our non-hunting bear mortalities. So that's any bear that we hear of being reported as deceased or that we pick up or that we have to euthanize for a variety of reasons that's unrelated to the black bear hunt. You can see, oh, since the early 90s, our non-hunting mortalities have steadily increased overall. Our overall trend has been increasing, which is an indication that our black bear population is increasing. Row kills is by far our number one form of um, non-hunting bear mortality. But recently you can see that light gray portion of the bar has been increasing. A lot of that is associated with the recent uptick in uh, sarcoptic mange in bears. And for those of you who are, aren't aware of what mange is, it's essentially a disease that affects their skin. It's caused by a mite that bites them. It's very itchy. Bears will spend a lot of time trying to rub it off, but the mite burrows in. Bear that kills the hair follicles, and the bears will oftentimes get a secondary skin infection and other infections as well. And it causes them to metabolize a lot more, it causes them to need to drink a lot more. And unfortunately, it can lead to um, death. So when we get a bear in hand that's in very poor condition due to mange, we the ethical thing is for us to euthanize that bear. So we do get a handful of those every year, unfortunately. And of course, our bear hunting season is another way for us to monitor our population. Um, permits are awarded through a lottery system. So it's 100% random how, who gets those permits. We do allocate a certain percentage just for Western Maryland residents. And then we cap that at 10% for non-residents. So no more than 10% of all permits go to non-residents in Maryland. It was quota driven until 2014, meaning that once we hurt, hit a certain number of bears in the hunt, we would close down or shut down. We've moved away from that. And we've, again, seen fairly stable um, number of bears harvested each year. It's a unique permittee subcommittee system. So one permittee can allocate two additional subcommittees to be on that to on that permit. But again, only a single bear can be harvested. And there's mandatory check stations. Uh, so every bear that's harvested has to come into a check station for us to collect biological data on it, uh, which informs a lot of our management. So that biological data, again, one of the primary things we get from that is age data. So we extract a tooth from every single bear that's harvested to get the um, get an idea of what our age structure in our bear population looks like. So for our bear population management, beyond our annual bear hunt, which is one of our biggest tools for managing our black bear population, we also have bear agricultural damage permits. So those permits are specialized, they're only allocated to those experiment, experiencing um, significant crop damage associated with bears, and they can only be used during a certain period of the year. But we get things like this. So I was talking about bear um, corn damage. So that image there on the bottom right, it looks like aliens came down and tried to do crop circles, but weren't very good at art. Reality is, is that's actually all corn damage from bears. Bears will go into a field, especially when it's in that milk stage, which it's really highly nutritious, easy to easily digestible. They'll go in and they'll literally just lay down and take their arms and pull corn stalks into them, just like this. 
and they'll just lay there and eat the corn. The unfortunate thing is that they'll, oftentimes they're just damaging the corn. It's not dead. It's just laid over, but it's now at a point where they can no longer harvest it. So the, the farmer loses a significant amount of their corn. Then, of course, you know, there's things like apple trees where they'll climb up the apple trees. They'll eat the apples, but more importantly, they're breaking branches. They're you know, negatively impacting that tree, potentially introducing it to disease, and it can die from either damage or disease and things of that nature. So crop damage and or ag these agricultural product, um, permits can go towards things of this nature. Very rarely do we euthanize habitual problematic bears. That's very rare. It's usually only occurs when it's a bear that we believe poses significant risk to our um, public from a health standpoint. No bear that's been habituated or is used to humans, someone had been feeding it and it's used to being hand fed. That That's a bad thing. A bear that's being fed is a dangerous bear because it has become accustomed to humans feeding it and has lost that fear of humans. And we don't want that. We also condition bear, problematic bears. So what I mean by that is we have two different things. So you can see there in the bottom left, we have some houndsmen that will actually run bears. So they'll chase them out of an area that they're either causing a lot of damage to, they're coming in frequently causing damage, uh, property damage, something of that nature. And it's, it's just a negative um, interaction for those bears, negative situation. So they make it a negative experience, the less likely to come back to that area. Then we also will trap bears and condition from that. So we'll trap bears and when we release them, we'll have uh, staff that will actually um, shoot them in the butt with rubber buckshot or these small rubber bullets that do not penetrate the skin. They, but they do you know, create a, a, essentially like getting punched. It, again, it's a negative experience. It's not intended to harm the bear but it's intended to make that a negative experience. We'll also use pyrotechnics. So you can see that individual closest to us in the picture on the bottom right, he actually is holding a little gun. It's essentially a flare gun. It'll shoot out a pyrotechnic that will make a loud bang, a big flash, and again, it startles the bear. It makes that a negative experience. They associate that area as a bad experience and they don't come back. And the biggest thing is people management. So I love this little comic because it it's essentially accentuates the importance of, of people management when it comes to bear management. And it says, and no one ever heard from the Anderson brothers again. And you see they're, they're there passing that cub around like it's a football. Fortunately, a lot of the problems that we have are human behavior related. So the best thing that we can do is inform our public on the behavioral changes that they can make to mitigate and reduce the issues or problems that they may have with bears. A lot of this is associated with food and trash. So bears, they're food driven. They want food. They put on a lot of weight for the winter. So a lot of the issues are associated with food products, whether that be actual food that you're cooking, like at a grill, a bird feeder, how you store your food or how you store your trash. And Again, it varies year to year, but on average, we're looking at approximately 30% of our reported nuisance calls are associated with trash. But there are some very simple solutions to trash. And that includes community trash compactors. That's been very successful in some communities in Western Maryland and other states. Bear-proof trash receptacles or dumpsters. So you can see there in the bottom right, that's a bear-proof receptacle where a bear uh, you or I would have to stick our hand up under one of those little raise areas and pull a lever and that will then open it. A bear can't do that. They can't stick their paw up and then curl their fingers like we do. Um, so they can't get into those. One thing that you can try is rinsing um, your cans with ammonia solution. Bears are very sensitive um, when it comes to their smell. They have an incredible factory um, senses. So they have really good scent, uh, sense of smell. And ammonia is strong, so they don't like that. So that can uh, help in certain situations. But the one of the best things you can do is 
just keep your trash inside until it's pickup day. No, don't leave your trash out where the bear can easily get to it. Keep it in a shed, keep it in your garage. Bear is much less likely to get into those areas and get into your trash and continuously come back. And work with your trash removal companies if you're continuing to have issues. No, it's in their best interest because their staff that's going to be going around most of the time picking up all that trash there spewed out. And it costs them time, it costs them money. And a lot of times they're often very willing to work with you to come up with a solution where that be um, a cost share program on the um, bear proof trash receptacles, dumpsters, or if, if it's changing when they pick up the trash. Bird feeders account for up to 20% of all of our reported nuisance calls. Easiest thing to do is don't feed your birds except during the winter months. They do not need bird seed to survive. During the summer, there's lots of food out there for birds. They don't need your bird seed. There's a lot of research to support that. No, during winter months when bears are less active or they're actually hibernating, you can have your bird feeders out and not worry too much about it. Bringing your bird feeders in at night isn't a, a good solution. Bears are incredibly intelligent and they're just gonna learn that pattern. And instead of the, the bear coming in at night and discreetly sneaking in and, and eating all your bird feed or destroying your bird feeder, it's just gonna come out in the middle of the day and you're just gonna see it eat all your bird seed or destroy your bird feeder. And then you'll just see it happen, which I mean, it's kind of fun to see bears. So if that's what you're going for, then go for it. Um. And, but this also applies to all wildlife feeding. So whether that be deer corn, mineral blocks, or anything else, bears are going to those same food sources. A Something that a raccoon's gonna eat, bear's gonna eat. Something that a deer's gonna eat, a bear's gonna eat. So you can't just put something out that's for specific to another species and, and think a bear's not going to eat it because they will. And this just is a quick video that I think is pretty fun. It shows you how agile bears are, how smart they are, and the lengths they'll go to get bird seed, especially something like black oiled sunflower seeds, which are highly nutritious, high in lipids, so high in fats, that it's worth you know being an acrobat to get. You can see they use all their all their appendages, they use their mouths, they use their tongues. And they, they're incredibly strong. I mean, I know I could not hang on to that bird feeder for very long like that bear did. So one of the things that our state has been working on recently um, for people management or just informing our public is we recently partnered with an organization called BearWise. BearWise is a nonprofit NGO, non-government organization that focuses on educational products. Um, so they, it's all based on sound science and they have a review panel of state and federal bear biologists. So before they put any information out, they contact all the state biologists and federal bear biologists and say, hey, is this good? Is this sound? Is this you know based, backed by science? And we approve it or we say, no, well, we should modify it like this. We should add that, remove that so on and so forth. So it's all high quality, really informative information. The, one of the biggest benefits of BearWise is that it provides consistent messaging from state to state. So what you hear in Maryland is gonna be the same as you hear in Pennsylvania. It'll be the same thing that you hear in Tennessee and California. It will all be consistent. So you know what I'm telling you to do to mitigate bear conflict or nuisances is the same thing that they're all gonna tell you. So that consistent messaging really helps to hone in and drive home you know, the important parts of bear management. They're also really affordable and pretty nice looking products. So from a state agency standpoint, it provides us with a great avenue to purchase products that we think the public will actually enjoy. Now, this is kind of not necessarily replacing, but adding to some of that current literature that we've had historically. Like if any of you have ever seen our learning to live with black bears, it has a, a pamphlet. It has a lot of valuable information in it. And it has a lot of the same info that those bear wise products have in it, just in a different kind of format. 
here's just a couple of examples of some of the, the one page pamphlets they have out. So one of their most popular ones are like the six at home bear wise basics and the six outdoor bear wise basics and, and things of that nature. So again, they're just quick little pieces of literature that are easy to read through, easily to, to digest and understand and super, super informative and effective. One nice thing about Bearwise is that they're really eager to work with our state agency. So for example, this, um, this is a poster on the left that was based on a two page document that they had originally that our state park was like, well, no, it'd be nice if we could have a one page poster to put on um, signs up at our state park trailheads to inform people about dogs and bears. So we worked with Bearwise to produce a one page poster that now many other states are actually utilizing. And then they have things like magnets, which are, you can see there on the top left, which go really well on any, <laughs> excuse me, any refrigerator. A lot of rental agencies are actually using these in the rental properties now to help inform the renters when they get into an area that's bear country. Or these really fun stickers, which go great on um, on water bottles. They even have fun stuff for the kids, you know, whether it be a, a door hanger or these fun little kind of worksheets, like you see there on the bottom, where can you find 11 things that will attract uh, hungry, curious bears? So just looking at Quake, you can see they left their grill unattended. They have don't have anything around the beehives in the back. They have a pie right in the window, things of that nature. So trying to get young kids um, to acknowledge little things that they can do to mitigate these bear conflicts. Now, bear biology and behavior is driven by three main things. That's bear density, time of year, and food availability. So density driven behaviors, you know, bears are territorial. Females have a home range of approximately 10, 10 square miles, while males um, have a home range of 25 to 50 square miles. So males have a much larger range. You know, males are typically larger um, individuals, weighing up to five, 600 pounds, as opposed to female, which typically weighs 180 to maybe 250 pounds. <clears throat> males and females are much more forgiving of other females in their range. And that's because black bears, they actually have a matriarchal hierarchy, meaning that there's a hierarchy based on the age of the females. So you'll have one dominant female, her female offspring will occupy a portion of her range, and then so on and so forth, moving out, kind of think of it like a uh, flower, a flower petals where they overlap slightly, but they all have their distinct range in the end. Now they do that because they want to be able to share resources in times of scarcity. So not every bear is going to have a lot of acorns or beech nuts or hickory nuts every year. While one bear may have that in the fall, another bear may have a lot of berries during the spring. So they tolerate based on that food um, sharing and availability. Young males have the largest home ranges. And that's primarily because young males, they get kicked around by everybody. They're not very large. They're not dominant bears at the, that point in time. And when they get kicked out during um, their dispersal period, when they're 18 months old, they just don't have a whole lot of place, unoccupied areas that they can kind of find and live and live out the rest of their area. So they get pushed around a lot and take up a large area trying to settle into a spot. Winter is our denning period. So that's kind of November through February. Then spring, they come out of the dens late March, early April, depending on how warm it is, where they are in the state. Early summer is when juveniles disperse. So that's in May, June. Again, they disperse at 18 months of age, so at that year and a half. And then June, July is the breeding period. So during the, really that May to July period, there's a lot of bear activity. Bears are moving a lot, whether that be dispersing or for breeding. So it's a very active time of year. Then the fall, once the hard mass comes on, and we have air, air, acorns specifically, that's some bears are really starting to try to put on a lot of weight, a lot of fat to get um, ready for denning again that coming winter. 
bears are incredibly intelligent and they're food driven. And so when they find a spot that has high quality food, they're going to remember it. But bears are also lazy. So they base where how they get food on three main things. It's the quality, the quantity, and the risk associated with getting that food. So if they have low risk, high quality, high quantity, they're going to go there every time. So things like trash, which we think of as poor quality, is high quality food for a bear. It's high quantity and it's relatively low risk. So that's why you see bears in trash cans a lot, why you see them going to um, campsites and things of that nature. They remember that one time that someone gave them a hot dog or threw them a sandwich, they're going to think that every camper is going to do that. So they remember that. Some <clears throat> defensive behaviors. Most of the time, black bear, unlike you know other species of bear like grizzlies or polar bears, black bear, they're going to flee or they're going to climb a tree. They're, they don't like conflict. They don't like confrontation with humans. Um, so they're most of the time, you're never even going to see a bear if it's in the area. They'll also swat the ground um, occasionally. So they do that to make a lot of noise, try to intimidate you, um, pop their jaw. So they'll just make this loud popping noise with their jaw. Again, it's try to you know, entice a reaction out of you. They'll huff or woof noises. So they're like trying to get you to react again. They'll lower their head and shake it kind of like this. Again, it, this, these are all intimidation behaviors. And very, very infrequently do they ever bluff charge, but they will. They'll run straight at you and then stop just a few short feet away from you. And then they'll usually pop their jaws. Again, they're trying to get you to react. They're trying to get you to um, leave the area. But those, all those behaviors, those last um, five or so behaviors, those are much less common than them fleeing the area and climbing a tree. Every once in a while, we'll get a report of someone saying they saw a bear that was standing up on, on their hind legs and they thought it was being aggressive. Reality is, is bears are just very curious and they want a better view. So they'll get up high so that they can see you better. It's not a sign of aggression or anything like that. It's just they're curious and they want to see better. It's just like us. Sometimes you want to see something, you get up on your tippy toes. It's just bears, they're usually on all fours. They can go up on two to see a little bit better. There are a couple of common features of non-predatory bear attacks in North America. Most of the time, it's associated with feeding. So bears that are accustomed to getting food from humans, usually intentional feeding, are much more likely to come in um, contact with uh, humans, more likely to bite them, swat them, or something like that, because they're mad they're not being fed. Or they're startled or surprised. No, that may include the presence of cubs. You never want to get between a sow and her cubs. You know, that mother instinct kicks in. She wants to protect them. Oftentimes it's outside of home, like on the porch when you're going to the trash and like that. And at, at night, you no, know, black bear is black. They are very difficult to see when it's dark out. So it's not very, um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see how you can get, be startled by a bear or a bear can be startled by you in a situation like that. Oftentimes, it's in the presence of dog, the presence of a dog, um, whether that's at home or in wild situations. By that we mean, no. Oftentimes, they're an off-leash dog, which is the case here in Maryland, where we had two instances in the last few years, um, where we actually had two individuals that were attacked by bears. Both instances were an off-leash dog, and that's because it incites a chase reflex in the bear. No, a dog will bark at the bear. They'll be super aggressive towards the bear. Then when the bear reacts, they come chasing. The dog will actually run back towards the human because, you know, that's where they're, they feel safe. And the human will get between the bear and the dog, trying to protect the dog oftentimes. Then the human's the one that gets um, injured. Mia always portrays the dog as a hero when, in fact, it's usually the main reason for the attack. <clears throat> so... Now, that's just a cautionary tale. Make sure that you keep your dog on a leash. Um, don't let them go running off when you're in an area that has bears, because the reality is that if they do come in con or come close to a bear, if the bear is going to go after the dog, unfortunately, you're probably going to get between you, the bear, and the dog. Human bear encounters and how to react. So always allow for an escape route. Never corner bear. Make sure that they have an easy way to get out. 
if the bear is unaware of your presence, just back away and really appreciate that situation. And I say that because only about 12% of the entire population in Maryland has ever seen a bear in the wild. So it's a pretty unique opportunity or situation and that I honestly think a lot of people should really appreciate. I mean, it's, you get to see this large megafauna, this large animal in its natural environment. And it's, it's just an amazing thing to see. And not many people get to see that. If the bear is aware of your presence, just back away slowly, leave the area and speak in a calm voice, just like you and I are. You know, when I see a bear and, and it knows I'm there, I'm just like, hey, bear, how you doing? I'm leaving. You just put your hands up, make yourself look as big as you can, chuck your stuff, um, you know, puff your chest out. And little things like that just make you look a bit slightly larger and more intimidating. If the bear does make contact, fight back with anything you have, whether that's a stick, your keys, a backpack, a ring, anything you have. And, you know, always, if you are concerned, feel free to carry a um, air horn or some bear mace, something like that. Just be sure to use it appropriately. And if you do set off your car alarm, make sure the bear is not in your car first. This particular individual thought there was a raccoon in their trash can, set the car alarm off, and the bear happened to be in the car when that happened. And you can see this beautiful Subaru Outback uh, was actually deemed um, destroyed. They totaled the car, unfortunately. It came out through that sunroof right there. So just make sure the bear is not in your car if that's the route you're going to go. With that, I'm more than happy to take any questions you may have. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out anytime you have questions related to bears or anything in our game program. Jonathan, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great closer with that Subaru uh, destruction. I was laughing out loud here. Um, Great. Well, we have a few questions coming in already through your talk, uh, so I will go through those. Anybody who's listening, please do feel free to, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom. You can click that and ask us questions. You can also use the chat. So I'm going to go in order of what we had. Uh, Karen Anderson asked, um, have increasing temperatures due to climate change had any effect on bears in terms of dinning or feeding or other behaviors? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, questions surrounding climate change and how's it, how it's really impacting bears. Now, one thing that we can confirm is that bears in general, whether that be black bear, grizzly bear, polar bear, whatever it may be, we are starting to see bears go into hibernation later and coming out of hibernation earlier. Um, and it one important thing to note when we're talking about that is Bears don't need to hibernate. Um, bears are actually not true hibernators. They actually go into a state called torpor, which is really just a deep sleep where their heart rate um, decreases, met, um, metabolism decreases. And in areas like in the south, southern part of the range in the southeast United States, there's a lot of areas where male black bear don't hibernate at all. As long as they have food available to them, um, they won't even hibernate. In Maryland, we have some bears like this year in particular, it's been a fairly mild winter. We are seeing um, bears fairly active throughout the year. And again, a lot of those we suspect are young males. Um, so we are starting to see bears not denning as early and coming out earlier in the year. Great question. Cool. Yeah. Uh, another one asked, uh, how do you locate and tag sows that aren't that aren't already tagged? Yeah, so every year um, we get reports for, of bear dens, whether that be a landowner was out walking and they happen to hear the cubs because um, they cubs, they, they make really cute suckling sound and squealing sound so that you can hear them from a little ways away. But a lot of times it's folks are out looking for deer sheds with their dog and the dog happens to be curious. They put their nose in the hole and they smell a bear, they're barking and the shed hunter goes up and like, oh, there's a bear. That's, that's a fairly common um, way that we get bears reported to us that aren't already tagged. Cool. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump over to the chat because I think I'm gonna try and go in order. Um, 
on this. And somebody asked, oh, you, when you were talking about the mange, uh, I think it's sarcoptic mange. I know I mentioned red foxes also get it. I don't know if it's the exact same species or not, but somebody asked, you know, can bear recover from this? Do we know enough? Like, are they able to, and if they are, if they can get it, um, can you rehabilitate them? And I, I know a little bit about that for foxes that it's possible, but very difficult in the wild to, to treat them, but uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, there's actually a big study that I believe is going to be published here relatively soon that Pennsylvania Game Commission just conducted or in collaboration with, I believe, Penn State, where they actually looked at recovery of bears uh, that were infected with mange. And they did find that, you know, indeed, bears can recover from mange. Um, the reality is that it just depends on the extent of mange. You know, a mild case, a bear can easily recover from a moderate case, they typically recover from, but when they get to a severe case where they're emaciated, they have virtually no hair, they have multiple infections, that's when we see a much lower survival rate, unfortunately. Fortunately, we don't see a lot at that real extreme end, um, but it does happen. Unfortunately, like, like Luke alluded to, um, there are treatments. There's a treatment that's uh, ivermectin, where it's an injectable, um, essentially antibiotic that can treat that infestation. The, the problem is, is that for appropriate um, treatment, you have to have repeat applications of this um, ivermectin. So in a wild situation where you have bears that are living on the landscape, reality is that we cannot capture them on a regular basis. No, it's very difficult to catch a bear one time uh, to begin with, and a second time, you know, during the summer is most most cases virtually impossible. So we could treat it once, and we could kill that the mites that are on it at that time. Unfortunately, it, be, it doesn't kill the eggs, so you're just killing a single generation of those mites. So it continues the cycle; it just delays delays it. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, in many instances, if we get a bear in hand that is so severe that we think it needs to be treated um, or that it's emaciated, the most humane thing that we can do is euthanize the bear because the reality is, is it likely won't recover from that level of um, you know, muscle loss in all reality. Cool. Um, Kelsey asked, are the bears most often killed on roads, young males, since they're the ones traveling the furthest? Mm -hmm. So um, for... Road kill bears, it really depends on the time of year. Um, come you know, spring, early spring, during that May, June period, a lot of the bears that we pick that are we pick up from row kills are younger males. Um, and again, like like you indicate, it's because they're making those big movements. However, during you know, July, late June, July, we could pick up mature males, mature females. Again, it's that breeding activity. They're being driven to run across areas they otherwise wouldn't have. And then the rest of the year, it, it kind of just depends. It's kind of a, a mixed bag of what we get, whether it's a male, female, young, old. It really just depends on you know, all reality, how much food is available in that particular area and how how much risk they're willing to take to go across that four lane highway to get to the acorns or the poke berries on the other side hmm. cool uh libby asked uh what features or specific types of bear spray do you like and recommend oh boy <clears throat> i honestly couldn't give you a good re recommendation i personally don't carry bear spray um i know if you go online and you look up some on some of the hiking forums they give some good recommendations um but the biggest thing in, for my my recommendation is just making sure that you read the instructions and you know very closely making sure that it's an easy to pull pin not something that you have to really think about and then if you do use it make sure that you know where the wind's blowing because if the bear is coming at you and the wind's in your face if you try to uh, use the bear spray at that point in time you're not going to get the bear all you're going to do is get yourself so just be a very very unfortunate situation our staff we use um bear spray on occasion to condition bears and that's happened to us and you know we're 
cognizant of making sure that that doesn't happen. But that that's the biggest thing I can recommend is making sure you know what direction the wind's blowing. Great, um, thank you. Uh, I'm answering this question at the very bottom that just popped in. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, about 220 days is the pregnancy period um, and it looks like they are polygynous in which one male will mate with multiple female mm -hmm. bears at a standard breeding behavior. Yes, um, and one female could be bred by multiple males as well, but it's not as common. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Kern asked, are bears susceptible to rabies? Yes, they are. So at, all mammals are susceptible to rabies. And um, I, to my knowledge, we've only had a few instances of bears with rabies. Um, but I, it's not many. And again, that's like nationally, it's not a very common thing to detect in black bear. That's always nice to hear. I know uh, it seems like I think raccoons are the number one uh, yes. vector for rabies in our state of maryland yes by raccoon. far i think it's at least 50 percent, maybe more yes raccoons. raccoons fox bats those are mm -hmm. in general yeah. are, are primary rabies vectors right um william needham had a great interesting question i'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, since only black bears instinctually climb trees is there anything to the theory that they were relatively small compared to the megafauna prior to the human diaspora twelve thousand years ago and survived the sort of extinction of all the megafauna, I think, is what he's alluding to, survived by taking the trees. So, uh, do you know anything? Oh, man. Made me go back to evolutionary ecology. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. So the big thing is that the reason that bear, black bears climb trees and that other species don't is you have to look at the environments that they live in. Um, so, for example, in general, grizzly bears live in a, in general, more open environment. And like you indicated, they are a much larger species. Um, so for black bear, again, no, they, they aren't aggressive. It's easy for them to hide in the woods of Western Maryland. They can, they can get away. And that likely did contribute to why they survived while other megafauna did not that they could escape to the trees, they could hide. They are a smaller bear species. So they could you know, get into areas that other larger species likely could. But a lot of it is primarily due to just the habitat that they occupy. And I mean, again, I could probably talk for a few more minutes on evolutionarily why they ended up in each region and so on. But that, that I think that's the gist of it. Cool. I love hearing about megafauna and thinking about them. It wasn't that long ago that we had mastodons and mammoths mm -hmm. running around this area. It's always uh, giant sloths. That's if you ever have a chance to go to the tar pits in La Brea in Southern California, it's it's remarkable to think about what was walking around mm -hmm. uh, and the skeletons they have there. Uh, imbiber of coffee. I'm there with you. I've got my coffee right here. Uh, imbiber of coffee asked. At what level of nuisance and neighborhood damage is help dealing with bear contact available from the state agencies? So if you are dealing with bears, I mean, if you see a bear, please report it, let us know. That helps us determine kind of if there's a bear that's moving through a certain area and where it's going, we can kind of predict where it's going. Um, but if you're experiencing issues with bears, you can contact us. Um, we have wildlife response technicians um, that specialize in this. So they will actually come out, they'll provide you with some resources on their mitigation, things that you, steps you can take to mitigate those conflicts, nuisance um, situations, and um, so on and so forth. In certain situations, we will actually loan out um, electric fences to landowners until you can get your own. So we provide a wide variety of different methods and tools um, to whatever meets your specific needs. And all you have to do is contact the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. You can call one of our field offices. You can shoot our um, customer service email or phone number. Uh, uh, give them a shout and they'll get you in touch with the person in your area that can help you the best. Great. Uh, the last two questions we have here, and thanks everybody for staying on. And thank you, Jonathan, for staying on a little bit past one o'clock. Um, uh, 
these were related. So I'll throw them together. Kern and Libby were both asking about food resources. Um, Kern asked about the presence and abundance of oak trees and acorn production with bear reproduction. Mm -hmm. And Libby was asking about what are the most desirable foods to bears, acorns, berries, pawpaws. Yeah. So those are both great questions. And um, regards of food sources, it really depends on the time of year. Uh, you know, come early spring, they're actually relying pretty heavily on that lush, new growth, green vegetation. Bears, they're omnivores. So they, they eat both meat and vegetation. And black bears specifically, they consume primarily vegetation. So, you know, during the spring, when the berries start coming in the summer, they rely heavily on berry patches, whether that be raspberry, blackberry, um, wineberry. Then come fall, you actually, they'll actually get into the poke berries pretty heavily. Uh, surprisingly, they rely fairly, they, they consume a large amount of insects. So bears, they'll actually go through an area and they will hone in on like a ground nest, a hornet's nest or a yellow jacket nest. And they'll actually excavate that nest so that they can consume the larvae. They're not necessarily going for the for honey or anything like that. They're actually going for the larvae because it's, it has high protein and high uh, fat content. During the fall, of course, they're looking for the acorns, the hickory nuts, the um, the walnuts, and things of that nature. When it comes to acorns, they'll actually hone in on white acorns before they'll go to red um, oak acorns. And that's because white oak. Um, actually has a higher lipid and they have fewer tannins which for tannins you find them in um, wine you find it in coffee and stuff like that it's essentially what gives it that slightly bitter taste it's a defense mechanism for plant for plants but it also inhibits digestion for um, anything that consumes it so they focus in on that species that has fewer tannins because they can digest it better and it's more nutritious um I think that answered that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any in, impact of reproductive rates because oh. of, in like good acorn years and things? Yes. So it's actually kind of delayed. Um, every once in a while. So if a bear's in good condition leading into the winter, she's much more likely to have cubs that winter. Um, if it's a poor mass year and a sow doesn't get put on enough body mass, she likely won't give birth or she may give birth to cubs, but she may not have be in good enough physical condition to you know, reproduce or to take them to the next level. There's actually kind of a, a delay too, where we'll see if there's a bad mass or mass year one year, and we'll actually see a impact the following year in the reproduction. So it's not necessarily, okay, what do we see this year? How does it going to impact this year's populations we have to look back two years on occasion and see what impacts that might have as well because again the the cubs will stay with the sows for 18 months so if there's not a lot of food the following spring after they come out of hibernation she may not be able to actually sustain those cubs through that first year so she may end up breeding again the following summer cool uh, the last question we have so far is coming in from Libby, and she has motion-activated cameras, game cameras that have taken photos of bears and cubs. They've had a one in-person sighting. Would you like? Would Marilyn DNR like to have that info? And if so, how do we how do we get it to you guys? Yeah. So I mean, so what we do is we report all sightings in counties. We actually don't keep track of sightings in Garrett County anymore, just because bears are so abundant in Garrett that we don't keep track of sightings. But you are more than welcome to shoot me an email um, if you live outside there or if you're seeing a bear, even if you live in Garrett County, if you're seeing um, something with those bears, like if you see it um, with mange or anything like that, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, that's probably your, your best way to get in touch with someone quickly is you can just contact me. Um, but again, if you get fun videos, interesting pictures, anything like that, feel free to share them. I love seeing that type of stuff. And, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I may put it in one of these presentations for everyone else to enjoy. Those videos were incredible to see that bear hanging from that, uh, that uh, bird feeder cable. I couldn't believe that it was strong enough to hold the bear. Mm -hmm. um, 
Cool. Well, and just for everybody to see your, your emails up there on there, Jonathan K. Trudeau at Maryland.gov. And uh, my apologies, Jonathan, at the very beginning, I think by habit, I hear Justin Trudeau so much in the news. I wrote Justin Trudeau in the in the slide. I don't know if you saw that, but apologies for that. It's um, all good. It, it happens fairly often. Right. Um, I corrected it on my uh, in a lot of places, but I missed it there. So um, uh, real quick. Also, everybody, thank you all for joining. And I, I know we're a little bit over. If you have a chance to jump on. Click that button in the link on the chat. Uh, you can join or uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps to increase the algorithm's uh, reach of all of our content so it reaches new people and it gets suggested to new people. So it's a good way to get all this information out to the public by by seeing little bumps and subscribers. So we'd love if you uh, hit the subscribe button for us. And um, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, look forward to, there you go. Are you going to subscribe for us right there on online? Oh, whoops. No, no, yeah. you're still sharing your screen. I love it. You can do it. That's okay. Make sure everybody had to hit subscribe. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Looking forward to next month, Bob White Quail with Kyle Magic. Uh, and we will uh, talk to you all then. Have a good one, everybody. Take Thank care. Thank you all. Thank you, Jonathan.